In January, I made a video predicting five climate change related topics that you should keep an eye out for this year. Now, in December, let's look back at how accurate those predictions were and very briefly review the current state of knowledge in climate change science and policy. First up, my somewhat optimistic, in retrospect, prediction about the post-COVID recovery. Turns out it wasn't very post. Because, as it turns out, the pandemic is ongoing, it's basically too soon to rule on this one. My concern was that if we follow the pattern of the last downturn in the global economy in 2008, that countries, and in particular I was concerned about China, may try to kickstart their economies with very carbon-intensive projects, for example in infrastructure. Going back to China, I predicted that they may make some big announcements at COP26, perhaps related to their COVID recovery strategy, which they didn't. But this year, China did make what on the face of it was quite a big announcement. They pledged to stop financing new coal-fired power plants abroad. And in a theme that may emerge from this video, this is good, but nowhere near enough. Because while China did finance 42 gigawatts of coal-fired power plants abroad in 2020, at home they have 1,000 gigawatts of coal generating capacity. So it's great that they're not building new plants, but at the same time they are by far and away the world's largest contributor to coal-based emissions. So. Let's see if we could do something about that, maybe? Prediction number two related to the Biden administration and specifically the Georgia Senate runoff, which the Democrats won and thus barely wrested control of the US Senate, which is significant because it allows President Biden to push through some quite ambitious legislature. We've already seen some of this. In November, Biden signed into law the Infrastructure, Investment and Jobs Act that delivered over $100 billion to climate and energy related action. So great first step. But that's peanuts compared to the Build Back Better Act, which as of the time of recording is still being debated in the US Senate. So while the Democrats now control the Senate, they only have a majority of one. And that means the party needs to be in total agreement on the wording of an act before they can push it through. So the Build Back Better Act has had some of its teeth removed, it's had some punitive measures over heavy emitters removed. But as it stands, if it's passed, then it will bring Biden's ambition of halving US emissions by 2030 within reach, which would be great considering the proportion of global emissions that the USA makes up. So if it goes ahead, very good news. My third prediction related to COP26, and I made a video about this relatively recently, so check that out for the full breakdown, but I'll summarize it as eh, good, but needed to be a lot better. I speculated that perhaps COVID would reduce the ambition of certain participants and it would just mean that the conference wouldn't get very much done, which I'm not sure actually happened. The thing which of course made all the headlines was that India and China watered down the wording of the final agreement such that coal was going to be phased down, not phased out. I suppose you could argue that this was done to keep their options open in a post-COVID recovery world where they, maybe they wanted to build some more coal-fired power plants, but that is wild speculation. My fourth prediction related to wildfires in North America, and unfortunately I was correct in predicting that this would be a bad wildfire season. In May, 75% of the western continental United States experienced drought conditions, and this led to a wildfire season that started earlier and, as it turned out, finished later. It's not to say it was uniform across the board, while in Arizona, for example, things were much worse than in 2020, California wasn't quite as badly affected as it was last year, which was really extraordinary. Extraordinary. And then my fifth prediction was about the global average temperature. Obviously the year hasn't finished yet, so it is too soon to officially rule on the temperature anomaly, but it's very likely that 2021 is going to be somewhere around the fifth or sixth or perhaps seventh warmest year on record. The past seven years are the seven warmest years on record. The reason why 2021 will not be the warmest year on record, despite the fact that CO2 concentrations are higher than they have been before, is because CO2 isn't the only driver of global average temperature. In particular, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO, has a large role in determining the global temperature anomaly, basically via the temperature of water in the Pacific. In 2021, the El Nino Index remained negative, which is to say that the Pacific was slightly cooler than normal, and that dragged down the global average temperature. 
But having said that, a global average temperature record was broken. Analysis by Carbon Brief indicates that 2021 had the warmest summer on record over land areas, which I guess you could argue is kind of more representative of the lived experience of a warmer climate anyway. So those were my predictions of the big climate change events of 2021, and I think I did okay, but of course it didn't cover absolutely everything. And the really big news story that I haven't talked about yet is of course the IPCC's sixth assessment report, specifically Working Group 1's report being released. So this is the report that looks at the physical basis of climate change, how we understand the climate system. I made a video breaking down the key takeaways of the report, but to give you just one statistic from it that I think summarises the whole thing, we narrow down our estimate of what's called the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This is a number that tells us how many degrees Celsius we think the planet will warm if we double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. We now think that number is somewhere between 2.5 and, and 4 degrees Celsius, with the likely answer being about 3 degrees. The reason that I bring up this specific statistic is because well, it's an important statistic, but also because it represents, I think, the process that climate change science has been going through over the past several years now, which is there's a lot of uncertainty in our understanding of the climate system, but we're narrowing down the error bars and we are getting a better and better picture of how the system works every year. This was formalised, if you like, by the Nobel Prize in Physics this year, which was awarded partly to Siokoro Manabe and Klaus Hasselmann for their work modelling the Earth's climate and predicting global warming, a real milestone for climate science. This number is also interesting because it didn't come from an analysis of climate models on a computer, but instead from a historical analysis, so looking at how temperature and CO2 varied in the past. And that's actually something that I talked about just last week in a video about the Osman et al paper that came out in November. This to me was one of the most incredible papers of the year because it looked at the past 24,000 years of temperature data and showed just how unprecedented the current warming that we're experiencing is, and that the global climate is currently in a state that it has simply never been in before whilst modern humans have been around. Amazing stuff, definitely check out that video to learn quite why it's such an amazing paper. So this year scientists painted an even clearer picture of how the climate system functions, how it functioned in the past, and how we think it's going to function in the future. So what are politicians doing about it and what has climate policy been doing this year? Well, coming into 2021, it was estimated that existing climate policies would limit the total global warming by the year 2100 to between 2.6 and 2.7 degrees Celsius. It's estimated that if all countries make their short-term pledges, so pledges by the year 2030 or so, then that warming that we'll see in the year 2100 will be limited to perhaps 2.4 degrees Celsius. While if all countries make their long-term pledges, so getting to net zero sometime in the second half of the century, then that warming in the year 2100 will be around 1.8 degrees Celsius. So even assuming a best case scenario where all countries meet all of their pledges, we're still not going to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. In fact, because the climate system has a certain amount of lag built into it, we may end up hitting close to 2 degrees of warming sometime in the latter half of the century. So once again, while progress has been made, the new pledges this year are definitely good news, they're not aggressive enough, they're not bringing down emissions fast enough to avoid the those really bad effects of climate change. Because, to round out this section with another statistic, we are running out of time to try and fix this problem. The CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere peaked this summer at a concentration of just shy of 420 parts per million. And that is a particularly significant milestone because 420 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere represents a 50% increase of CO2 concentrations from pre-industrial levels. Incidentally, if you'd like to learn why there's an annual cycle in this graph, along with a whole bunch of other stuff to do with it, then perhaps you should pre-order my book, Firmament. It's about the development of atmospheric science. It's out in January, and the link is below. So that was my ultra rapid roundup of the big climate change news from this year. But what can we expect to happen next year? I have three predictions. 
Prediction 1, Climate Finance at COP27. These Conference of the Parties events are meant to happen every year, we just didn't have one in 2020 because of the pandemic. So next year in Egypt, in COP27, there's going to be lots to unpack from COP26. I predict that money is going to be the big talking point at COP27, specifically money in relation to the phase down, not out, of coal. If countries in the global north are insisting that countries in the global south don't develop using coal, then there's going to be an extra price to pay in association with that. And who is going to pay? Where does the money go? Who gets to decide? We may also see talk of a new finance system to help countries that have been hit by weather events made more extreme by climate change. And frankly, all of these conversations are long overdue. And maybe we'll see some new pledges come in that will lower the amount of warming expected by 2100 to one and a half degrees, though I'm not holding my breath on that one. Prediction number two, the sixth assessment reports working groups two and three. The sixth assessment report isn't finished yet. We've only seen working group one's report. We still have working group two, which is about the expected impact of climate change and Working Group 3's report, which is going to be about mitigation of climate change to come, both are expected next year. My prediction is that geopolitical sparks will fly when Working Group 2 release their report, because Remember that the impacts of climate change are not uniformly distributed, and the populations of some countries are going to get a nasty shock next year when they learn that the outlook for the 21st century isn't that great for where they live. And we may see the rise of a quite insular way of looking at the world, and people closing off their borders and saying that migrants are not welcome. And that is only going to heighten geopolitical tensions. Also, when Working Group 3 released their report, I predict we are going to see some hilarious tech bro takes on how to mitigate and prevent climate change. Perhaps specifically actually in regards to carbon capture. Please don't get taken in by them. And finally, prediction number three, a temperature record. I was wrong on this front this year, but the El Nino index cannot stay negative forever. And the current outlook is that it's more likely than not to become at least neutral in spring next year. Without the effect of cooler Pacific waters masking the overall warming signal, we could well see a record set for global average temperature in 2022. Though unfortunately, this is a prediction I could make for most of the years in the coming century and probably be correct. Perhaps I'll do one of these recaps every year. Let me know in the comments if you found this ultra rapid roundup of the big climate stories useful or interesting. Though if you would like weekly coverage of this kind of thing, then I've already mentioned them. Carbon Brief is an excellent source, as is the YouTube channel Just Have a Think. I'll leave links to both of them down below. Perhaps I'll be back next Christmas with an evaluation of how accurate my predictions were this time. Now this year, instead of doing Christmas presents, my family has nominated charities that we'd like others to make donations donations to. So for example, my aunt has asked for donations to the RNLI, while Pixelgirl and I are asking for donations to a local cancer hospice. But in recommending a charity, how can you be sure that they're really having a positive impact, or that your money's being well spent? You could do a bunch of research yourself, or you could use GiveWell, who have kindly sponsored this video. GiveWell is a free-to-use, not-for-profit foundation that spends over 20,000 hours researching the efficiency and effectiveness of charities every year. They focus on recommending charities that help people the best and can prove they do so via transparent practices. Basically, they simplify the process of finding and donating to outstanding charities. In particular, GiveWell currently recommends a bunch of charities that do great work providing healthcare in the global south, and if you'd like them to allocate your money where it's needed most, you can donate to the GiveWell Maximum Impact Fund. If you'd like to join the 50,000 people who have already used GiveWell, confident in the knowledge that their donations will be used wisely and used transparently, then GiveWell are currently matching donations from first-time donors dollar for dollar up to $250. To donate, go to the link in the description and use the code Simon Clark at the checkout to make sure that your donation gets matched. Thank you to GiveWell for sponsoring this video, and please do donate generously this Christmas. Thank you for watching the video. I hope that 2021 treated you kindly, and if not, I hope 2022 is better. I'd also just like to take a moment and say thank you because this is the last video of the year. I want to thank you for making this my job and for allowing me to hopefully make the world a better place via these videos. So I wouldn't be here without you. Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like some recommended viewing next, then here's some over here. You can check out GiveWell just below me, along with a subscription button if you're not already subscribed. And that just leads me to say, happy holidays, 
Thank you again for watching. I'll see you in the next one.